Good evening and welcome to the Nixon Seminar on Conservative Realism and National Security. I'm your host, Mary Kissel with Stevens. We're honored to have Ambassador O'Brien chairing the discussion alongside our seminar members and two very special guests. Tonight, we have a special program to mark the 50th anniversary of the repatriation of members of the American Armed Services held as prisoners of war in Vietnam, men and women that Nixon called courageous in action and even more courageous in captivity. We'll start with a video from ABC News' David Muir. Roll tape. Only tonight here, the moment a nation held its breath, the prisoners of war in Vietnam finally coming home, 50 years later, with us. It was the relief and the joy in this country 50 years ago. U.S. servicemen who had been held captive in Vietnam as prisoners of war were finally coming home. Norman McDaniel, back on American soil. It was 1973. I have a wonderful wife and two wonderful, wonderful children. Held captive for 2,399 days, more than six and a half years. Fifty years later, he and fellow prisoners of war, right here. I am Norman A. McDaniel. I was shot down on July 20th, 1966. Tom Hanton. I was a young captain when I was shot down. On the 27th of June, 1972, Lee Ellis. I was a first lieutenant and uh, was there five and a half years. Everett Alvarez, lieutenant junior grade. I was captured eight and a half uh, years. All four men shot out of the sky and captured. Their treatment was brutal. They drag you out of the cell and interrogation, torture room. They would spend years communicating through prison walls by tapping. I would tap, so to say, hi, you go two, three, two, four. That's it. Mm -hmm. We would sign off every day with this one. That's uh, GBU. God bless you. That was like goodbye and God bless you. It was 1973, many years into that war, the peace treaty, the Paris Peace Accords, were signed. The POWs finally started to come home. The image back then, Everett Alvarez walking off the plane with a salute. He has not forgotten that moment. It was unreal. It was, it was uh, uh, overwhelming. Mm. In the right-hand corner of this photo at the bottom, that's Tom Hanton. This was the reaction when the aircraft commander of that C-141 said, we're in international waters. I mean, yeah. to hell, eight <laughs> years, eight and a half years. Lee Ellis, boarding the plane home, handed a cigar. Regrown my mustache, which most fighter pilots back then had, so I could go home like I came in. Norman McDaniel, when he was reunited with his wife and his son, who was 11. I will never forget. He said, we're never going to let you leave us again. Hmm. To honor the 591 POWs coming home, President Nixon invited them to the White House. Servicemen walking in on crutches, some wearing eye patches. And this week... 50 years after that dinner, so many of those POWs together again at the Dixon Presidential Library. 150 POWs from 37 states. They told us why this reunion was so important. I think it's important because they're all heroes to me. Well, they're the best. I'd die for any of these guys. I just thank God for every one of us who came back, and I feel so sorry for the ones who didn't make it back. We're just grateful. We've had good lives. We're grateful. We honor them then. We honor them now. Heroes. I'm David Muir. Good night. Very moving. Uh, tonight, the Nixon Seminar will look at the past, at that courageous experience of those POWs in the Vietnam War, and apply the lessons learned to the present day and some of the strategies that are being used today to bring our men and women home. I'd like to turn first to Ambassador O'Brien, who was at the commemoration event at the Nixon Library in Yorba Linda, California, in these recent days. Ambassador, uh, first, congratulations. You've just been named uh, co-chair, I hear, of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Uh, tell us a little bit uh, about that event and your time uh, with these American heroes. 
Well, you, you go to an event like that and it was a gala dinner and the, the men were all dressed in their, uh, their blues and their, their formal, uh, their best uniforms. And you're just so humbled and honored to be in their presence. I mean, these are the bravest and most courageous uh, men who went through literally hell and, uh, and came home, their, their honor intact, their love of the country intact and uh, came home to their families in the country. And, uh, and they're still so proud of their service. They're proud of the fact that they were resilient under the most trying circumstances. And, uh, and I was just, the, the entire evening was just uh, an evening of, of humility to, to be in their presence. And one of the things I shared uh, at the end of the, the dinner when I spoke were the words of President Nixon uh, that he, he made in his memoirs. And if you mind, Mary, I'll just, it's very short. I'll just quote President Nixon. Uh, he said, Talking about that night, and we we we, we recreated the menu and recreated the the event in the East Room at the library, so it, it had the feel of being in Washington. It had the feel of being at the White House, and uh, and the Nixon family was there. Patricia Nixon and uh, Ed Cox, her husband, were there. Uh, so and, and they were at the original dinner, and and so it, it really had the feel of a of a, a reunion and an anniversary. And because so just to, just to interrupt you there, because Nixon, when he was president, after the peace accords were signed, brought those POWs to the White House to celebrate their return home. Correct, and then they showed video of that that original dinner, and uh, everyone looked a little younger. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, they had some of my heroes. Uh, they had entertainers. They had Bob Hope and John Wayne and Jimmy Stewart, who all all came to welcome the POWs home. It was a uh, and and people were quite emotional. And so I read what Nixon said uh, that night. He wrote in his diary, the show did not end until after midnight, and the dancing went on until about 2 o'clock. But Pat and I went upstairs at about 12.30. I kissed her goodnight, and then I went to the Lincoln sitting room. I sat before the fire, listened to the sounds of the music and laughter coming up from downstairs. And I felt this was one of the greatest nights of my life. There were no words then, and there are really none now, that can describe the joy the satis and satisfaction that I felt at the thought that I had played a role in bringing these men back home and that they, who were completely courageous and admirable, genuinely seemed to consider the decisions I had, I had made about the war to have been courageous and admirable ones. And, and uh, that's how I finished my, my remarks and, and you know, wish God's blessing upon the POWs and those that are still with us. And it's amazing after how they were treated and, and what they went through. That there's still 150 of them that are. Uh, that are with us and sprite and healthy and uh, and vigorous and uh, and then I wish God's blessing upon them in our country and it was just quite quite an evening, Mary. It was uh, for for those on the, the call or who are watching us that that had the chance to go to that gala dinner. It was a uh, no one will forget. It, it was quite special. Well, you know, the, as time goes on, uh, I think history can be um, dulled or even forgotten. And uh, Nixon uh, also wrote, Mr. Ambassador, about the treatment of these POWs uh, and then the horrors that they went through. He referenced um, handcuffs, leg irons, being hung from the ceiling, beatings uh, with bamboo whips and rubber whips and, and, and fists. Um, it, it seems as if these men uh, not only survived real horrors, as do hostages today, um, but they did it in a kind of triumph of the human spirit in the way that they came out and were able to, to go to that White House event and to celebrate and to, to, to maintain uh, this kind of positivity and upbeat spirit that, you know, you witnessed uh, just a few days ago at the Nixon Library. It's quite extraordinary. It was really wonderful. I mean, when you think about how poorly they were treated, you know, beyond the physical abuse, one of the stories that was relayed to me was about one of the Air Force pilots. Uh, the, the North Vietnamese did not let his, his wife know that he was a captive and he was in for five or six years and uh, she assumed he was dead, the, the DOD assumed he was dead and she was, she got remarried, uh, you know, understandably so. She was a young woman with young kids and uh, and he said what got him through the the, the imprisonment was the, the thought of getting home to see his wife and uh, and then to have to get home and then to have his parents meet him at the airport or at the air base and, and learn that his wife had been remarried was a, was devastating to him and I'm sure to his wife. And uh, those are some of the things that these men went through in, in service to the country and uh, very hard, very hard things, but both, both physically, as you pointed out, but also mentally and emotionally, the, the, what they had to do. And, and our hostages today and our, our wonderful detainees today uh, have experienced many of those same, uh, same deprivations.
Well, for those viewers uh, who don't know, uh, Ambassador O'Brien was not just our national security advisor, uh, but also the hostage negotiator uh, for quite a period of time. So it was very familiar uh, with with these with these cases. Uh, Am Ambassador, just just staying for a second on Vietnam. Um, you know, again, for those who we weren't alive when the war was being prosecuted. Um, or you know, didn't have relatives who participated. Uh, I believe Nixon was what the fifth president to deal with 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 the horror of Vietnam. I mean, some of these men were in prison for not one but two, but many many years, and still managed to 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 maintain uh, their spirit and and their hope for freedom. Well, that, it's their, their patriotism that's so amazing that they they, they went through some of eight, nine, ten years of imprisonment. Uh, and you know, a lot of them went through three or four years or five years, but uh, a number of them went through almost a decade of imprisonment in the Hanoi Hilton and, and other terrible locations in, uh, in North Vietnam. And uh, and they came out loving their country, loving their family, loving their God. And and that, 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 that it's really, as, as you pointed out, Mary, it's a triumph of human spirit over uh, over the worst of humanity. Uh, they they showed us the best of humanity. And I, I again, I couldn't be more proud to be an American when I'm in their presence. And uh, and they're a real example to uh, to servicemen and women today, and what it means to take the oath of office to, to go into the armed forces. But uh, but we've also seen that same sort of uh, you know dedication and, and love of country and, and some of the wrongful detainees that have been taken, just regular American citizens who have had the same gratefulness and uh, and, and a happiness to get home to their, their native land when they were released from from prison. Well, I do want to turn it to the present day and kind of the, the complicated practicalities of dealing with wrongful detainees or hostages. And we will explain what the difference is. Let's bring in our other seminar members to the discussion. Uh, although, uh, Mr. Ambassador, of course, we're going to have to throw the, the first question to you as the former chief hostage negotiator. Uh, what is... Uh, really, the 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 main challenge of the job uh, is it the number of people uh, that are detained? Uh, is it the kinds of deals that you have to strike? You speak a little bit about the job itself, and maybe explain that distinction between wrongful detainee and hostage, which I don't think is very widely known. Well, let me take a, on the wrongful detainee versus hostage situation because it's a, it's a distinction, but in some ways it's without a difference. So. Hostages are taken by non-state actors, terrorist organizations like JNM or Al-Qaeda or ISIS or the Taliban. Uh, wrongful detainees are, are men and women who are held by the governments of, of the lawful governments of countries like the Russians, the Chinese, the, the Iranians who, who take our, our citizens hostage, but, but call them detainees, usually on trumped up charges, fake charges, scam charges, uh, and then use them as a tool of diplomacy to gain leverage over the United States of America to try and get us to do something to change our policy, to pay the money, to make a concession, to do a prisoner exchange. And, and it's a way for these countries to, to try and, and bully America. And they do it because they know that we care about our citizens. Many countries wouldn't care. You could take a, a hostage from some countries and they would give the, the, that government no leverage. But because Americans care about our, our, our family members and our friends and, and our, our citizens abroad, they know that we'll we'll do things to try and get them home, and they can they can elevate an issue of a, a hostage a terrorist organization, or they can uh, try and get a, a prisoner exchange like Victor Bout for for Brittany Griner with the Russians, and and so it's, it's become a tool of diplomacy, and, it, and it's becoming more widespread. But for the individuals who are detained or held hostage, there's not a lot of difference if you're held by a, in a Russian gulag or in a uh, in a jail cell or a, a, a cellar in in a Taliban controlled Afghanistan or or JNM controlled uh, that desert in the Sahara. As, and so as far as it, what makes it, the job hard is, you know, we, we, we've got to figure out without paying ransom, because we don't pay ransom, we've got to figure out how to get Americans home. And how do we do that using all the tools of national power, diplomacy, military, uh, economics, uh, and, and using those tools to bring our citizens home. And one of the things I did, I'll, I'll mention this, is, when I first became the special presidential envoy for hostage affairs in 2018, uh, early in the Trump administration, the memo that described what our office did, the SPIHA office did, said, we only use military force as a last resort. I immediately changed that memo. I said, mm -hmm. we're going to use military force as a first resort, 
Yeah, we're going to rescue our hostages using the military. That's why we set up special operations. That's why Delta Force was set up after the the the, the Desert Eagle fiasco with Iran and that failed mission when we tried to rescue the hostages in Iran using the military. And we, we came up with Delta Force, and then we came up with Dev Brew, SEAL, SEAL Team 6, which is commonly referred to. Their primary job is to rescue American citizens held hostage abroad. And so I changed it, and the people at the State Department, some of them didn't like it. They thought it was uh, too aggressive. But I wanted, I wanted to send a message to our adversaries that we're going to come find our, our hostages, and we're going to rescue them to the extent we can with the military. Now, you can't necessarily do that if you're if the hostage is in a prison in downtown Moscow or in downtown Beijing. We're not necessarily going to start a war. But we did have a number of successful hostage rescues uh, using the military, both our military and our allied military, the UAE, France, and, and other countries. So, you know, every case is different, and, and every case requires different tools. But one of the things I try to do is, is start putting fear back in our adversaries. That this isn't going to be an easy way to make money. You may lose your life or your, your own liberty if you take an American hostage. Well, it's a very Nixonian position. Uh, we'll use another Nixon quote. This is from his book called No More Vietnams. He wrote, quote, in dealing with the North Vietnamese, I had very little faith, this is Nixon speaking, in a policy that relied on the negotiating process alone. To seek peace at any price was no answer to an enemy who sought victory at any price. I want to bring in Alex Wong, who also, uh, like the ambassador, has had experience um, dealing with uh, Americans who have been detained abroad, in his case, North Korea. Alex, um, uh, bringing you into the discussion uh, about a, a regime like North Korea, which, which is incredibly difficult uh, to negotiate with, um, how do you have that mix of carrot and stick like the ambassador referenced, as Nixon wrote about in his book. Right. It's it's difficult. But I, I want to jump off on something that, that Robert said. You know, if you look at the countries that make a routine of taking hostages for, for, for leverage, whether it's North Korea or Russia or Iran or, or, or China, the, the, the through line there is that these are countries that, that don't respect individuals, that see individuals uh, as not having their own personal dignity. And they know that we value the individual. We value the, 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 the dignity of each human being. And they try to turn that into a liability. So in responding to this, it, it's key for us to keep the mindset that we need to turn what they view as our liability into a strength, meaning that we will always keep at the forefront of our policy those hostages who are taken uh, uh, unjustly and in all aspects, not just in the bilateral relationship and our interactions with these countries, or, or with uh, countries in which non-state actors are acting, but also with third countries, so that if they are seeking benefits, uh, uh, economic, security, or political or prestige benefits, that that is something that we're leveraging, not just directly with them, but with other third countries, so they are feeling pressure on, on a full spectrum uh, of, of the diplomatic realm, That so they we turn the hostage situation rather into a liability for us, a liability for them and an impingement on their interests. Now, that is sometimes a patient game, but that's one that we have to play. And one, again, that takes advantage of our value of, of humans and turns it from a liability into a strength. Now, in the North Korea context, uh, you may remember that uh, in, in prior, about a month prior, less than a month before uh, the first Singapore summit, the first summit between President Trump and Kim Jong-un, uh, we were able to secure the release uh, of three hostages who have been held for, for, for various numbers of years, uh, one as, as, as long, I believe, as, as, as six years. And uh, that happened because we were able to leverage Kim Jong-un's desire for a summit, desire for prestige on the world stage, where this was a condition for us to have that successful summit. Now, some people, uh, they may not remember, from the moment that President Trump agreed to hold the summit with Kim Jong-un, it wasn't a smooth path from agreement to, to the actual summit. There was a lot of give and take, a lot. It, Trump even canceled the summit uh, temporarily at one point, and that was jockeying for position. Who would have the advantage going into the summit? And it was very key for us, to, again, to keep the hostage situation uh, at the at the forefront of this uh, 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 jockeying, so that we had the advantage where they needed to that the North Koreans needed to set a good environment for a summit to happen. 
And that is why that created the conditions for the release of the hostages. And I'll tell you, Secretary Pompeo usually joins this, this, this seminar. He's not here tonight. I don't want to speak for him. But that release happened in the first few weeks of his Secretary of State uh, uh, stint. And I remember him saying, uh, you know, he knew it was early in his time. Uh, he knew he had many days ahead of him as Secretary of State. But it was going to be hard for 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 uh, any day to beat that day when he welcomes home those those three American hostages at, at Andrews. Well, you know, it, it, so many points <laughs> worth uh, elaborating on there. Uh, but one of them is you know, the fact that the United States puts puts our hostages first, as you've just described. Nixon did, too. Um, getting American POWs home was a, a, a just the, the starting position of the Paris Peace Accords, that that was just not negotiable, that we had to get our people home. Uh, I want to bring in Kim, Kim Reed uh, as someone who has uh, worked a portfolio, which I also think is like like the hostage negotiations, actually an incredibly um, a bipartisan effort in a Washington, D.C. that is not necessarily uh, very bipartisan on much of anything at all. Kim, um, should we be you know, happy about that and proud of that as Americans, that whether it's a Democrat president or a Republican president, um, that you know, putting our people first uh, is, is not negotiable? Absolutely, uh, Mary. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just coming from an event. Uh, I'm on the board of an organization called the American Swiss Foundation, and I was with the current Swiss ambassador to the United States, Jacques Pitaloo. And I've heard firsthand from him many times um, how important Robert O'Brien was when it comes to when it came to hostage negotiation and bringing our people home. I also have a great story of when I was sworn in as the chairman of the Export-Import Bank back in uh, 2019. Robert was with me in the Oval Office, and uh, President Trump comes in, and I'm with uh, my father and my siblings, and uh, Robert's with me, and the president comes in ready to to administer the oath, and he sees Robert. And Robert at the time was our hostage negotiator. Robert, I don't know if you remember this, and I'll have you comment on this in a second, but he honed in on, Robert, how many Americans have we brought home so far? And uh, I'll have you tell, tell about that, but uh, he knew how important Robert's service was to uh, this country and, and our planet on this important mission. That was like topic number one uh, before uh, my swearing in. I wanna uh, uh, go back to Switzerland and I would like Robert to explain this a little bit more, but S Switzerland is a neutral country, but they serve a very important function when it comes to uh, POWs and helping us have back channels with adversaries to return our citizens. And I just want to thank um, that government for all they do to help us in this, this very important way. And finally, I want to remember Senator John McCain, who, for those of us who were born uh, I was born in 1971, but after um, the Vietnam War, in uh, uh, October 21st, 1967, uh, a missile shot down uh, uh, Senator McCain's uh, Skyhawk uh, dive bomber. And um, he was 31 years old and um, was brutally beaten and tortured for five and a half years. And he could have been released earlier, but he resisted. And I just want to read something as we think about what these POWs go through and where they're coming from. And I'm so grateful that the library just honored so many of these Vietnam POWs. But Senator McCain said in his memoirs during that time of being a POW, I have never felt more powerfully free, more my own man than when I was a small part of an organized resistance to the power that imprisoned me. Nothing in life is more liberating than to fight for a cause larger than yourself. So I just want to remember him. Thank you. Uh, it's a really a beautiful story and an important, important remembrance. Uh, it's also an echo, Kim, of what Ambassador O'Brien referenced earlier, which is 
that it's it's not always the United States uh, doing it on our own. We do have many countries uh, that we work with around the world that help get our people home. Robert, I, I, I see you nodding your head. I'm not sure a lot of viewers out there are aware uh, of countries like Oman or, as Kim says, Switzerland. Can you speak just a little bit about that before we bring in our special guests for the evening? Well, thanks, Mary, and thanks, Kim, for those kind words. Uh, very generous of you and overly generous. But I want to thank Alex Wong because uh, yeah, Alex is, is very modest in the, in the role he played, but he played a, a critical role as the deputy special envoy in North Korea in helping to bring the uh, the Korean hot, the Americans who were held in North Korea home in the DPRK. Uh, so Alex, it was great, great diplomacy and you and Steve Began and the president and Secretary Pompeo. I also want to give a shout out to Secretary Pompeo. I, I, I was very fortunate in, as the hostage envoy, the two people I reported to, President Trump and, and Secretary Pompeo, we're 100 percent committed to this mission and, and the mission of bringing Americans home. So uh, in some ways, it's a, it's a very difficult job. Uh, it's maybe the toughest job in government is to be the, the hostage envoy. But at the same time, I had an incredible amount of support from, from Secretary Pompeo and from President Trump, and that, that made my job easier. So that when I went to talk to these third party governments and, and we couldn't bring as many hostages home as we did without, the, without out our allies, uh, the Swiss played a critical role, especially in Iran. Uh, where where Swiss, Switzerland has an embassy and has diplomats, and and when I went to see the president the first time to talk about hostages, uh, Sarah Levinson Moriarty's dad was on the, the agenda, and and Bob Levinson had been our longest held hostage uh, at the time, and we didn't know if he was alive or if he'd passed away in, in captivity, but the president said bring him home, and if he's passed away, bring his remains home so he can be buried here with his, by his family and he can rest in, in peace in his country. And, and uh, unfortunately, I wasn't able to get that done. And that's something that, uh, you know, when, when I left office with this, the SPIHA and as national security advisor, uh, I, I felt terrible about that. And, uh, and, and some of the other hostages, the, the, the four hostages, Sawak and Kasich and Mueller and, uh, and uh, Foley, uh, who were killed by ISIS, that, that we weren't able to bring their remains home either. But we, you know, we, we tried our best. But in all these cases, uh, we, we relied on third parties, and the, the, the Swiss were at the forefront of that. But there were other countries. Qatar uh, did some great work for us. The UAE rescued a hostage, Danny Birch, uh, using an intelligence operation that was very sophisticated and, and uh, saved his life. Uh, you know, one of the hardest times I had was uh, I was in Paris coordinating a hostage rescue with the French, and the French used their special forces in the Sahel in Burkina Faso <clears throat> excuse me, to, to rescue four hostages, two Frenchmen. A South Korean woman and an American woman, and uh, they had to hit the compound, all, all the structures of the compound at the same time because they didn't know where the hostages were being held. And the SOP for the terrorists is to kill the hostages at the first sign of a raid to deter future raids. And so when the special forces go in, they hit every room at the same, every structure, every room at the same time uh, to try and save the hostages. And two French Marines went in, uh, their first names were Alain and Cedric, and uh, exchanged gunfire in the room that the hostages were being held. And they sustained mortal wounds and were killed. They killed two two hot, hot, hostage takers in the gunfight. And I had the chance to go meet with their comrades and uh, and, and uh, thank them for their their mission. So we were we couldn't get people home at the rate that we do, uh, and at the success that we had in the Trump administration. And, and I give the, the Biden administration credit too. They're bringing a number of people home uh, without being able to rely on, on our allies, whether it's Switzerland or France, traditional allies and partners, or. Uh, some of the Gulf nations or, or other countries that step forward to help us uh, try and bring these folks home. So uh, critically important. And uh, Kim, when you see Ambassador Pitalud, he's a, he's, a, he's a great humanitarian and a great ambassador. And, and was a, he was head of their intelligence services in Switzerland before becoming ambassador to uh, Washington. And, and he, he was a, a great partner in this effort on, for, for me. And I know he's doing the same thing for Ambassador Roger Carson's the current special envoy. So please, please extend my Gratitude to him when you see him. Well, again, uh, I, I think when the national media is usually focused on you know, big cases, when famous people are detained, for instance, you mentioned Brittany Griner, uh, ambassador, uh, WNBA star who was detained in Russia and subsequently released. We tend to forget uh, just how many Americans are detained around the world uh, since Secretary Pompeo isn't here, I'll just share uh, every day uh, the, the way he started his day after he got the 
uh, intelligence briefing, he would sit down with his executive team and we would talk through all of the Americans uh, that uh, were wrongfully detained or in danger around the world. So it really is uh, the first thing that uh, is on the mind um, of uh, our political leadership and uh, cabinet officials, the president, et cetera. I want to bring in, though, our special guests because we're going to have a lot to talk about with them. Uh, Sam Goodwin uh, was detained at a Syrian army checkpoint in the northeast part of the country in May of 2019. He was trapped in their prison system for 62 days and detained in the Syrian capital in a prison known as the Branch of Death. He was in solitary confinement for 27 days and was released on July 26, 2019. He's now in a doctoral program at Johns Hopkins University. Sam, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Mary, thanks so much for having me. And, and thanks to the, the Nixon Foundation for the opportunity to contribute this evening. Uh, when I think about the theme of this event and in this evening, I uh, the, the the resilience and the patriotism of the POWs is inspiring, and it's just a real honor to be uh, included tonight. Well, we're delighted that you could join us. I also want to introduce our, our other very special guest, uh, Sarah Levinson Moriarty, whose father, Robert Levinson, was the longest held hostage in American history. He died in Iranian captivity. Sarah is an advocate for all American hostages. The Robert Levinson Hostage Recovery and Hostage Taking Accountability Act that passed in 2020 was named after her father. She's a member of the commission at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, a fellow at New America, an advisory board member at Hostage US, and much more. Sarah, also welcome uh, to the Nixon Seminar. Thanks so much for having me, and thanks to the Nixon Seminar and to Ambassador O'Brien and Secretary Pompeo as well for all that they've done for us in the past. Um, those answers that we got in March of 2020 were thanks to them. Well, I, I'm going to talk, uh, there's just a lot to talk about, and we unfortunately don't have a lot of time, but we'll try to get as many questions uh, to both of you and to the seminar members as possible. Sam, uh, I want to start with you as someone who has had a personal experience uh, as a, a person wrongfully uh, detained in uh, terrible conditions. Um, many Americans, uh, thankfully, have never had this experience. They don't know anyone who's had this experience. Can you just speak a bit uh, about what that was like and what you think that viewers should know um, ab about the experience of an American hostage? Sure. So when this happened to me, I was scared, confused. I had no information or anyone to help. I was desperately trying to understand what was happening. Uh, I, I was stunned. I was in disbelief about what had happened in just a few short hours. My life had spiraled out of control in the most terrifying of ways. I, I, I felt exactly the way they wanted me to. The Syrians wanted me to. Hopeless and utterly cut off from any control of my life. But the, the message that I would send to, to anyone who I hope nobody ever finds themselves in this situation but if they do, uh, my message would be to, to know that there is a committed and sophisticated team of people who are working to bring you home as quickly as possible. On that note, I wanted to, to quickly mention that uh, when I was taken in Syria, Ambassador O'Brien was the, the special presidential envoy, and my family worked very closely with him. And, and when I came home, I learned about uh, I learned about th this thing about Ambassador O'Brien that when he was a Spiha, he had these uh, baseball cards of, of all the hostages. And I, I had the opportunity to actually talk. Uh, one time I was talking to Ambassador O'Brien's wife, and he told me that Robert would look at these cards at the office. He would look at them at home, eating breakfast before he went to bed. And I think this really, it, it really humanizes these people, one of the big issues, I think, with with hostages and wrongful detainees is that they can feel very distant. We can feel very disconnected from them. And I think these cards really helped humanize them. And when I came home, uh, Ambassador O'Brien gave me my card along with a, a very nice letter. And today, uh, I probably look at it 
as much as he did because it's such an incredible reminder of how fortunate I was and, and how grateful I am to be home. And I think that this is a testament to, 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 to Robert's commitment, not only to this issue, but to our country as well. Sam, when we hear the term uh, hostage, for instance, um, we often think of you know, men in, at war, like the Vietnam POWs, members of the U.S. military. Um, and yet many of our hostages are not members of the military or intelligence services, just kind of average Americans who are uh, going around around the globe. Uh, have you been surprised uh, when you speak to audiences, um, you know, are they are they aware uh, that if they, you know, wander into to um, China or, or uh, near the border of um, Yemen or other or other places, such places, uh, that they're at risk. And one of the things that I think is at play here and something I often say is to 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 never judge people by the actions of their government. Uh, I, I've been fortunate. I've traveled to every country in the world and, and everywhere I've found incredible people. And unfortunately, that doesn't always line up with with uh, with the actions of of a particular government. And for example, uh, the, actually, the day that I was released, uh, Robert was uh, Robert was dealing with a, a case that was uh, relatively high profile, but not something you might expect. Dealing with actually a rapper in okay. in, in Sweden. So so you know whether it's a, a rapper Rocky, in, we just Rocky, and, and ASAP Rocky. ASAP Rocky can't forget. I that. think Robert's kids had to tell him who he was, but the the uh, whether it's you know whether it's a rapper in Sweden or a basketball player in. Russia or a traveler in Syria or a journalist in Iran, whatever it might be, uh, there there are a range of different circumstances and cases, and, and no two cases are the same. And and uh, since being home, I've just realized how 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 fortunate I was that my case ended peacefully, and and to put so much into perspective. Right. Well, I want to bring in one of our seminar members, uh, John Noonan, who works up on Capitol Hill, because John, you know, we've been talking a lot about the executive branch. Uh, Robert's job at the State Department as hostage negotiator, the uh, the attention the Secretary of State paid to the issue, or presidents, Republican or Democrat. Uh, does Congress care? Does Congress participate here? I mean, what's the function of the legislative branch in this process of getting our people home? I think we've got you on mute, John. Can you hear us? Let's see here. If we can get them on the screen, I apologize for the technical difficulties there. Are you come, am I coming through loud and clear now? Perfect. Okay. Um, well, look, I, I have to um, one thank you for hosting a, a terrific conversation. To um, add my name to the Robert O'Brien fan club, um, you know, in addition to everything that he did uh, in the last administration, um, not just bringing helping bring home American host or American POWs, but um, American war dead. Um, I think he galvanized Congress in a way uh, that um, that demonstrated probably the highest level of interest in the hostage POW um, uh, policy issue, probably since the, the video that we watched where we were seeing the, the clips from Operation Homecoming um, in 1973 when Nixon um, successfully brought so many American POWs home. Um, one is because he was successful. Two, it was because at least every time he got on the phone with with my boss, Senator Cotton, um, no matter what they were talking about, hostages always came up, and he was he would remind them, uh, members of Congress, senators, and House members alike, of the importance of not leaving any American behind. Um, there are several pieces of interesting legislation going through the House um, and the Senate right now. Um, I think as a result of the interest that Robert helped galvanize. Um, on the congressional side. And if, if you know anything about Congress, um, not necessarily known for its comedy, but there are two key areas where they work very well, to, where Republicans and Democrats tend to work very well together. Uh, one is veterans issues and the other is um, national security and defense. Uh, I would add uh, hostages and those wrongfully detained to that, um, uh, to that list. Um, two quick examples of, of legislation that's either been introduced or has been passed in, the, in just the last 24 to 36 months. Um, there's the U.S. Hostage and Wrongful Detainee Day um, Act, which um, sets aside a day 
uh, for the American people to remember and acknowledge those who have been um, held overseas against their will or left behind. Um, and then a stop penalties on the American on American Hostages Act, um, which uh, does what it says it does, uh, adds a little IRS relief for those who are um, those who are who are wrongfully detained or, or held overseas. I will um, um, I will finish with just a very very short anecdote um, because I think it's so apt given the the intro video that you showed, Mary, um, where. Um, you know, President Nixon had said these people are truly the best of America, and he was talking about Operation Homecoming. Um, over the course of two presidential campaigns, I had the opportunity to meet a man named Colonel Leo Thorsness, who was a uh, an Air Force fighter pilot. He he flew F one hundred fives, which are essentially bombers, um, and he took his what is fun, fundamentally a bomber took it into a dogfight with with MIGs, which are fighters. And if you know anything about fighters versus bombers. Um, some are designed to fight, some are designed to fly slow over a target and, and drop things. Uh, he took his, dom his, his bomber up against um, North Vietnamese MiGs, shot a few of them down, um, um, eventually uh, got home to, he had to tank to get home. So he had to get the, he had to hit the tanker to get gas to get home because he had spent so long fighting, he was going to um, crash into the the jungle, um, and he offered his tanker to somebody else who had less fuel than he did. Totally selfless human being. Two day, two missions later, he was shot down um, over over North Vietnam. Uh, he was held for six years in captivity, and um, after those six years, he learned that he was being awarded the Medal of Honor uh, for his actions in that dogfight, um, awarded to him by President Nixon. And this is what I'll leave you with. Colonel Thorsness always told me that any day, any day where you have a doorknob on the inside of your door is a good day. And that never left me. And I still think about it today. What a story. Well, thank you for sharing that, uh, John. And um, with with that, I, I think it's a it's a nice segue uh, over to, to Sarah. Sarah, we're very sorry uh, for your family's uh, loss. Uh, of your father, uh, Robert Levinson. I think many people who are watching tonight may be thinking, gosh, you know, I'd, I'd like to help. I'd like to get involved. Um, but I, I'm an individual. I don't work for government. What in the world can I do? Uh, you work on these issues. Can you speak a bit to that? Um, you know, what are the avenues available to help? And um, what, is, what is really effective? Over to you, Sarah. Absolutely. And thank you so much for the question, Mary. I um, I want to jump on something that John was talking about, which is some of the legislation currently in Congress, because I think that people can call up their representatives or their senators and encourage the swift passage of some of these legislations. Um, so he mentioned the hostage and wrongful detention day, um, which I will note is March 9th, which is the day of my father's disappearance. Um, but a part of that is also a hostage flag uh, modeled after the POW flag, which would fly at the State Department and eventually hopefully at passport offices uh, to raise awareness and to help remind people that we still have Americans who are being held just for being American. Um, and that is currently um, with Congress. It just passed the Senate side. And so Hopefully, if people can encourage their um, congressmen and women to uh, pass it swiftly on the House side, we can see that go into law soon. Um, there's also a piece of legislation uh, around supporting hostage and wrongful detainees and their families, and that includes uh, support for travel to D.C. to advocate for their loved ones. Um, as well as mental health support, both during the ordeal for the families and afterward for when they return home. Um, so these are two things in Congress right now. Um, as well, I think just in general awareness among our people. And I think Brittany Griner was a good start in getting the public speaking about this issue, um, as well as Evan Gershkovich. Um, but having more public awareness of it, more calls to action. Um, 
there's two elements of deterrence that we are trying to face um, as a country. One is for the countries themselves, but the other is um, to stop Americans from going to these countries and making themselves victims of this, or not making themselves, but opening themselves up to victims like this. Um, so I always joke, how do we get the Sam Goodwins of the world to be aware um, of the dangers of going to some of these places so maybe we can um, save him from the hardship that he that ordeal that he went through. Um, so I think there's a lot of different things. There's a whole life cycle of the hostage enterprise um, that we could look at from awareness, support of families, return home of the Americans being held, deterrence, and then justice for the victims. And there's so many different things that people can get involved in from any aspect of that, as well as to push our um, United States government to pursue a lot of things under those different you areas. Know, Sarah, you, you mentioned Evan Gershkowitz, Gershkowitz rather. Uh, he's, of course, the Wall Street Journal foreign correspondent who was detained in Putin's Russia re recently. Um, Sam, uh, and I'm going to ask you the same question uh, that I'll ask Ambassador O'Brien and Sarah. I'd like you to chime in here, too. Uh, you mentioned, Sarah, putting pressure um, on government and, and raising awareness. Uh, Sam, what, what role does the media play? Uh, because so often, you know, governments want to deal government to government. They don't want these cases to be made public. But should they be? And, and in which circumstances is, is that helpful? And in what circumstances is it harmful? Thanks. I think Sarah and, and, and Ambassador O'Brien will probably be able to articulate this better than me. But I know that when my parents were dealing with with this ordeal, they were faced with the decision of whether to go public or not. And of course, uh, well, there were some people advising them to to uh, to stay quiet and to keep everything uh, under the table. There were others advising them to 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 go to The New York Times or go go public, put put to put that type of pressure on. But of course, once you go public, you can't go unpublic. So that's a huge decision. And there are uh, the, the hostage enterprise has, has really grown to, to support these families through that because oftentimes they, they don't know how to deal with a situation like that. My, my family certainly did not. So I think it's, it's, um, it's, it's case by case and uh, it's, it's hard to know exactly what might work in one situation and what might not work in another. Well, Ambassador O'Brien, uh, just to Sam's point, as with so many things that we talk about in this seminar, uh, this you know, foreign policy problems are not black or white. Um, how did you think about using a tool like the press in hostage situations? Did you ever use it or did you keep it all uh, you know, private and uh, government to government or government to foreign actor? Well, there, there were times when we did use the press, and, and it's not a hard and fast rule to, be, to use the press or not use the press. And uh, it really depends. E each case is different, and each hostage case is different, and uh, each detainee case is different. Uh, in some instances, the press is useful, and some it's not. But uh, I, I can tell you just with, you know, re re with respect to Sam, he mentioned his parents, Ann and Tag. Uh, there, there was no one who advocated for, for a hostage uh, the way his parents advocated for him. And... Uh, I was on the phone with them regularly. They came and visited me with the State Department. And in his case, talking about third parties, we had a Lebanese general, Abbas Ibrahim, uh, who was, was the head of intel in, in Lebanon. And he played a critical role, far more than I did, in, in getting Sam released from Syria. Uh, I remember flying to Lebanon to thank him and, uh, and have dinner with him to thank him for his efforts with respect to Sam and also a couple of other officers that we had. So that was an example, and, and, and getting him home that day was one of our great days. At the same time, you know, I look at, at Sarah and uh, her, her mom and her brothers and sisters, and uh, and and just like, well, while Sam's day, the day to day got home was a great day. Uh, one of the toughest days we had was down in the Situation Room when uh, I, I can't mention the other senior leaders that were with me for for some security reasons, but we sat down with the Levinson family and Sarah and had to give them the, break the bad news that. Uh, that we'd lost uh, Bach and that uh, he, we, he was not going to come home alive and he was not going to see his, his kids' weddings and grandkids. And, uh, and that was a tough day. And, and the way that the Levinson family responded, uh, you know, and you know, everyone responds differently to these sorts of tragedies, they could have very easily been bitter, withdrawn. And instead, 
Sarah and her family have made it their life mission to, to help others who are, in, who are in the same position that, uh, that they were in and try and make sure that, that something good comes out of what happened with Bob and the fact that we have the Levin Snack now, which was passed through Congress that, you know, John talked about a bipartisan effort to, to assist hostages and the fact that we have other legislation that's not pending that's, that Sarah's the primary mover on. You know, that, that's a real testament to her and her family and how they responded to the tragedy. And uh, uh, again, so I, you know, I look at, uh, at, at Sam's family and at the Levinson family, and uh, you know, they, they approach these things differently, but uh, they, what, what great Americans, and it gives you a lot of faith in, in our country and a time when we have a lot of polar, polarization that uh, that John talked about and, and, and difficulty in the country. We've got, uh, we've got great Americans like Sam and, and Sarah who are out making a difference for, for people they don't even know. I mean, they, they, they don't know more, you know, any of the hostages who are taken out and yet they're giving their time and talent and sacrificing to, to bring people home that they don't even know. And, and so I'm, I'm grateful for, for them to, that they're staying in the fight and, and are, are still involved in this issue. So, so Sarah, thank you. And, and God bless you and your family and, and Sammy as well. And uh, proud, proud to know both of you. Well, Sarah, you, I just want to pick up on something that you you mentioned earlier, which is you know, looking ahead, as, as, as the ambassador said, you're trying to help people that you don't even know. You, you mentioned uh, that many Americans who are traveling abroad uh, may not be aware of the danger that they're putting themselves in. And I, I think, for instance, about our travel advisories that the State Department puts out. If you read the travel advisory today for a place like China, this is the world's top jailer of journalists. It has uh, many Chinese Americans under effectively house arrest, uh, arbitrarily uh, detained two Canadians, uh, the two Michaels case, which is a very famous case um, in retribution uh, when the Huawei CFO uh, was detained by Canada. So they, and we later learned that Beijing actually has a list of foreign nationals that they can just take at any time when they feel like they need political leverage. And yet, if you look at our travel advisory, it says, well, you know, it might be kind of risky to go to China, but you could still go. Um, are we doing enough? How do we get the word out so that Americans can be informed when they travel to those places, fully informed? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually, I had a conversation with Deputy, Deputy Secretary Sherman about this a few weeks ago. He's and Deputy Secretary I, at the State Department. Yes. Wendy Sherman. Um, and we were talking about this very issue because I was explaining that if we could get the flag up at passport offices or if there was some way, because you see a handful of different types of people who are traveling to these countries. Some go for business um, and there's ways to deter through companies to stop them from going. Uh, then you have people like Sam who go for the love ad adventure and travel and um, the opportunity to see these beautiful places. And then you have, and I hope I, I was fair in how I said that about you, Sam. Um, <laughs> and then you have people who have family in some of these countries who they see their family like in Iran, not getting the medicines that they need. So they take it upon themselves to go bring them the medicine that they need. Or they, they think this might be the last time that I'm going to see my father because he's dying. And so how do you tell someone that they can't go to one of these countries to see their loved one? Um, and the best that we can do is just to try to warn them as much as possible about the risks. Um, and with the State Department advisories, people aren't necessarily looking at those. And so that was part of what we were discussing. And we came up with maybe if there's a... a poster at a passport office that catches your eye with some of these countries that are doing the most common wrongful detention taking, um, or if there's a pamphlet about the risks of certain countries, or at the point of sale, I actually, I was laughing to myself um, earlier, I was Googling flight to Iran, flight to Russia, just to see how hard it would be to, to try to fly to one of these countries or to book a um, Airbnb in one of these countries. So if there's a way that either there's a, a flag that comes up, are you aware that the State Department is currently saying this? Um, or adding a tax to deter people so that maybe there's a monetary punitive element to it and not punitive, but uh, deterrent for getting these people to go to these countries. Um, you have to get the message to them somehow. 
uh, because you're right, they do. Iran, as soon as we hopefully one day have the Americans home from Iran, they have so many others that they could pick up immediately. And if I might just go back to the previous question, I just want to say my advice from 13 years, now 16 years of doing this is if your loved one is held captive um, in a country, speak loudly for anyone to listen. Um, Jason Rezaian and I, who was held by Iran and released in 2016, we've had this discussion over and over again. S yell it from the rooftops. Anyone that could possibly listen, because that's the way that your loved one is going to come home, in our opinion. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. And yes, I, I hope our viewers never have to take that advice. But of, of course, it's 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 important advice for those who do need it. Uh, Alex Wong, I, I just want to go back to you. I know we only have a couple minutes left. I want to get back to to everybody for final comments. Um, but you know, this seminar is also about practical strategies. And uh, have we uh, gotten that balance right of um, the the diplomatic aspect versus putting real pressure on some of these regimes that are just trying to extract money or or other benefits out of the United States. How do you see it? Well, you know, in, in the abstract, it's hard to 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 prescribe the you know the 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 right playbook for each situation. Every situation is is unique. And the political dynamics and the the interest of the the opponent on the other side of the table or or, or the hostage taker is different. But I will say that there's not always a, a tension between talking and pressure. And, and many times the talking is necessary to frame and deliver the pressure, or that the pressure will come if there is not a release, not an action uh, uh, on the part of of the opponent to. Uh, uh, to, to, to resolve the hostage situation. It doesn't always mean that the talking has to come from the U.S. government, though. Uh, as Robert said, there are a lot of third parties, perhaps with more credibility, perhaps with more trust relationships with uh, whatever country or, or, or terrorist group uh, or, or third party group that has taken the hostage. So that is always a, an intricate tactical decision. Uh, but I, I do think that uh, it is not always intention. The, the diplomacy or the talking here has to frame the pressure, has to frame the incentives, offer the off-ramp, uh, but also lay out very clearly the consequences. And I want to talk about consequences. We shouldn't be shy about that. You know, Robert described some of the uh, exquisite uh, military um, options that the United States has, some of the, the, the intelligence and, and military options that some of our allies have. That we could leverage and and uh, and ask them to to uh, uh, to impose upon uh, uh, those who would take Americans hostage, we shouldn't be shy about talking about that because our opponents fear that. That is a great uh, advantage, a, a great uh, piece of leverage as a superpower, as a, a country that invests so much uh, uh, in our our equipment and training and our military forces. Uh, we should not be shy about that. We should use those tools. Doesn't mean we have to always shout that we have these abilities or we're going to use them. But we should tell our opponents that that is an option. It is always on the table. And communicating that through talking, threatening them, I think, is, is, is a key. Well, we're down to our final minutes. I want to make sure we have time for final thoughts from our special guests in our chair. Sarah, I saw you nodding along as Alex was talking. So maybe we'll start with you. Final thoughts. Is there anything here that we haven't discussed or uh, that you think should be emphasized? Yep, for sure. Thank you. And I'll try to be quick. So I think Alex is very right. I think there's carrots that we focus on a lot, but we also need more sticks. Right now, our stick is sanctions. Um, I think we can do things like making wrongful detentions a crime. So um, taking ki doing kidnapping is a crime, but making a wrongful detention is not explicitly a crime. And then we could actually start indicting people as a result of that. Um, we could also open up the Foreign Sovereign Immunities Act to um, have a technical correction so that, again, wrongful detentions um, could suffer from private litigation. That's a huge deterrent for a lot of these countries. And then increasing the sanctions under the Levinson Act to be specific to wrongful detention. I think we need more of these sticks. We need to clear this late and get people home, but then we need to be using these sticks as hard as we can. All very practical suggestions. Sam, uh, over to you for... Any final thoughts on what Sarah said or any of our other participants tonight? 
just quickly, I would just I just want to thank you and the Nixon Foundation for for raising awareness around this issue. It's a national security issue, and it means a lot to have the the panel here this evening taking time to to raise awareness for uh, an issue that is uh, th that's critical to to our nation. Well, we appreciate both of you uh, joining us tonight. Before we go to the ambassador for final thoughts, I did want to make one note for viewers before you go. Uh, the Nixon Foundation recently launched something called Captured, Shot Down in Vietnam. It's a serialized podcast that tells the story of the Vietnam POWs with new episodes being released weekly. So uh, go to the Nixon uh, foundation website uh, for more information on that, or you can contact us about it. Uh, Ambassador O'Brien, final thoughts. Nope, I think we've got him on mute. Ambassador. Hey, thank you, Mary. I, I just want to express my appreciation to you and uh, to Alex and, and John Noonan and Kim Reed and, and, and others in the seminar who aren't here, especially Secretary Pompeo. Uh, you were all my partners when we were bringing hostages home, whether I was a SPIHA or the NSA, and uh, and you all played an important role, and you've been humble about it, and, uh, and it's, it's important. I think what we saw from the POW dinner the other night and from the reporting on it is how happy America was, all Americans, not Republicans, not Democrats, all Americans to see those POWs come home and how much it meant to us as a country. And, and that was a polarized time as well. We're in a polarized time today, and... Uh, I think we see when, when Sam came home and we saw the outpouring of love for the Levinson family, the passage of the Levinson Act, uh, we, we've seen the appreciation that we've had for our American hostages coming home. But this is something that brings us together as a country. And that uh, the reason it brings us together as a country is because we love our fellow citizens. We love Americans. And, and I think that will help elevate our, uh, our debate and other things. And, and one thing I'd ask you to do is uh, uh, this is uh, – Maybe it's it's inappropriate, but I, I'd ask you to keep in your, in your prayers the current leaders in the administration and the Congress, uh, people like Roger Carson and Jake Sullivan, Tony Blinken, Mark Milley, uh, President Biden, who are charged with this issue, whether you're Republican or Democrat, keep them in your prayers that they'll keep the hostages and, and the issue of the hostages at the top of their minds and that they'll have success in bringing them home. And uh, Again, I think this is something that you know John Noonan talked about is bringing bringing Congress together. But I think it brings us together as Americans because we, at the end of the day, we do care about our fellow citizens who are held abroad. We saw it with the POWs. We see it today as hostages come home, and I think that gives us a lot of hope for our country. You know, very well said, and uh, and a hopeful note that we should end on. Uh, we just want to thank uh, our chair, Ambassador O'Brien, our special guests, Sam and Sarah, for joining us, the seminar members, the Nixon Foundation team, and all of you are watching. Please follow us across television, podcasts, radio. We're all over the place, and we love to hear from you. That's it for this month's Nixon Seminar on conservative realism and national security. We will be back in September. So we're wishing you all a very, very happy summer. Please come back to us in September. In the meantime, check out that new serialized podcast. I'm Mary Kissel. Thanks for watching. Good night.